Mom then will heal Aphrodite. I'm skipping now. Hera and Athena begin to taunt Aphrodite. This is fun. So I'm at line 490. Um, and, and they will say, uh, some, you know, taunting to Zeus. So she mocked. And the father of gods and mortals smiled Zeus broadly, calling the golden Aphrodite over. And he says, so Zeus says to Aphrodite, fighting is not for you, my child. The works of war. See to the works of marriage. The slow fires of longing. Athena and blazing Ares will deal with all the bloodshed. And of course, it's humorous and it's ironic, right, that Zeus will say to his daughter, you got what you deserve. You're the goddess of love and beauty. Stay out of fighting and stay out of wars, right? Okay. Um, and then, uh, from, from there, then, we will move really quickly down to Diomede versus Aeneas and Apollo. Because, of course, Aeneas... Um, is going to be protected uh, by Apollo. Three times, three times Diomedes will charge at, at Aeneas with Apollo standing there. I'm at line five, uh, 503. Frenzy to bring him down. Three times Apollo battered his gleaming shield back. Then at uh, Diomedes' fourth assault, like something superhuman, the archer Apollo, who strikes from worlds away, shrieked out a voice of terror, Think, Diomedes! Shrink back now, enough of this madness striving with the gods. We are not of the same breed. We never will be the deathless gods and men who walk the earth. Menacing so that Diomedes pulled back just a little, edging clear of the distant deadly archer's range. And Apollo swept Aeneas up from the onslaught, set him down on the sacred heights of Pergamus, the crest where the gods' own temple had been built. There in the depths of the dark forbidden chamber, Leto and Artemis, who shower flights of arrows, healed the man and brought him back to glory. In other words, Aeneas would have died on the battlefield, but now he's brought back. Of course, that's significant if we know anything about the Aeneid, and we'll get there later, won't we? But the Lord of the Silver Blow, Bow, Apollo, devised a phantom like Aeneas to the life, wearing his very armor, and around that phantom, Trojans and brave Achaeans went at each other, hacking the oxides round their chest, the bucklers full and round, skin shields, tassels fly. But Phobos Apollo called to blazing Ares, 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 destroyer of men, reeking blood, stormer of ramparts. Can't you go and drag that man from the fighting, that daredevil Diomedes? He'd fight Father Zeus. He's just assaulted love, Aphrodite. He stabbed her wrist like something superhuman. He even charged at me. At this point, Ares will then spur on the Trojans, and we will then have the great hero, Sarpedon, at line 540. As Ares whipped the fighting spirit in each man, Sarpedon, a Trojan, taunted Hector, and I told you this happens, right? Hector, where has it gone? That high courage you always carried in your heart. No doubt you bragged that you could hold your city without an army and Trojan allies all on your own, just with your sisters, husbands, and your brothers. But where are they now? I look. I can't find one. Hector is motivated. Aeneas is healed and returned back to the battle. Back to the battle we go, and we will then have Odysseus ready, along with Diomedes, to start to fight, right? Um, uh, together, right? Agamemnon, however, is going to motivate the men. He says at line 610, Now be men, my friends. Courage, come, take heart. Dread what, com what comrades say of you here in bloody combat. When men dread that, more men come through alive. In other words, be worried about Cleos, the way people are going to talk about you after the battle, right? When soldiers break and run, goodbye, glory. Goodbye, all defenses. In other words, whatever happens, don't. Don't be a coward, right? Don't be a coward. Well, um, we then will have, um, uh, with Agamemnon, his kill, his comments as well. Um, um, and, and Aeneas will also have kills as well to uh, a, couple, a pair of twins. Menelaus will have a kill. And Telachus will have a, a kill with more rock throwing. And then Diomedes will see Hector with Ares. And then we'll have a series of his kills Ajax kills back and forth. Sarpedon will kill um, Hercules' son, Telotnus, uh, uh, Telotnus, 
and uh, then Sarpedon is wounded, and then finally saved by Plagion. Finally, we will have a list of Odysseus's big-time kills. We have um, a list of seven different men that he kills, um, and then the list just provided. Then Hector, and he will have six different kills um, at line 810 that so many of the, of, of the uh, different men that Hector will kill. Finally, we're told that Hera has seen enough. And we're at line 8, uh, 15 or so. But soon, as the white-armed goddess Hera saw them all mauling, Argive units caught in the bloody press, the Trojans are now starting to win. Remember that Hera wants the Greeks to win. She winged her words at Pallas, Athena. What disaster, daughter of storming Zeus, tireless one, Athena. How hollow our vow to Menelaus that he would sack the mighty walls of Troy before he sailed for home if we let murderous Ares rampage on this way. Up now set our minds on our own fighting fury. And then you get this really interesting um, kind of thing where Hera and Athena are going to prepare for war. Athena will actually dress for battle, as uh, will Hera as well. And they're ready now to go out and enter into the war. So notice how it is that Athena and Ares had that agreement at the beginning of the book. Okay, okay, we're not going to fight. Okay, okay. And now both of them are going to come down to get involved in the fighting itself. We have this very interesting ironic speech uh, at line uh, 865 or so where Hera will speak, white-armed Hera, called out at once to the powerful son of Kronos, pressing home her questions, and now she's going to speak to her husband. Father Zeus, she says, look, aren't you incensed at Ares and all his brutal work because the Trojans have killed a lot of Greeks, right? Killing so many brave Achaeans for no good reason, not a shred of decency, just to wound my heart. I mean, you could just, the, the, the ironies are just dropping here as the poet says, this is what Hera says. I mean, think about all the people that have died because of Hera's foolishness. I mean, the war was ended when Menelaus defeated Paris, but no, no, Hera has to have more. And she's going to talk about decency? While there they sit at their royal ease, exalting the goddess of love and Apollo, lord of the silver bow, they loose this manic Ares. He has no sense of justice, Father Zeus. I wonder if you would fume at me if I hurled a stunning blow at the god of war and drove him from the fighting. Zeus, the father, who marshals ranks of storm clouds, gave commands. Leap to it then, he says. Launch Athena against him, the queen of plunder. She's the one, his match. A marvel at bringing Ares in pain. And so uh, we have then both of them joining the war. Hera and Athena join the Greeks. We have Hera who will give her taunts right to uh, the Greeks. Shame at line uh, 915. Shame, disgrace you are guys, you Greeks. You degraded, splendid in, splendid in battle dress, pure shame. In other words, you're dressed up to look like warriors, but you're not fighting. As long as brilliant Achilles stalked the front, no Trojan could ever venture beyond the Darden gates. They were so afraid of the man's tremendous spear. Now they're fighting far away from their city, right up by your hollow ships. So in other words, the promise that Zeus made to Thetis that in fact the Trojans would make it all the way to the ships, it's going to happen. Here it's Hera taunting. Then we will have Athena as well taunting. But she will say, but you, um, she will say um, to Diomedes, I stand by you as well, line 932. Uh, I guard you too, and with all good will I say, fight it out with the Trojans here. But look at you. Fatigue from too much changing has sapped, too much charging has sapped your limbs. That or some lifeless fear has paralyzed you now. So you're no offspring of Tides, the father, the gallant, battle-hearted Onus' son, or back to fathers and sons. Often, sons will be taunted into in, 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 in forced challenge to become better warriors by saying you're not half the fighter that your father was, right? Well, Diomedes um, bowed at her at once. He says, well, I know you, goddess, daughter of storming Zeus, and so I will tell you all gladly, I'll hide nothing. It's not some lifeless fear that paralyzes me now. No flinching from combat either, I'm at line 945. It's your own command still ringing in my ears, forbidding me to fight the immortal gods head on. All but one of the blessed gods, that is, if Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, slips into battle. She's the one to stab with my sharp bronze spear. So now you see, 
I've given ground myself and told my comrades to mass around me here. Too well I know that Ares leads the charge. But the goddess roused him, Athena, her eyes blazing, true son of Trites, Diomedes, joy of my heart, forget the orders. Nothing to fear, my friend, neither Ares nor any other god. You too, I'll urge you on with so much winning force. Up now, lash your racing horses at Ares first. Strike him at close range, no shrinking away here before that headlong Ares. Just look at the maniac born for disaster, double dealing, lying two-faced god. The ironies run, run deep when Hera is calling another god double dealing and two-faced, right? <laughs> Liar. Just now he promised me and Hera the war god swore he'd fight the Trojans, stand behind the Argives. But now look, he's leading the Trojan rampage, his pledges thrown to the winds. So you've got this, um, so you've got this uh, Athena throwing down, right? Go and fight, right? She is now fighting with Diomedes and the two of them, it's a very famous passage now, will wound Ares, the god of war. Diomedes, the great Greek hero, will wound the god of war. So this will be the second god that he will wound, right? But Athena, I'm at lines 385, but Athena, her eyes a fire, I'm getting back to more fire imagery, right? Grabbed the flying shaft, flicked it over the cart, and, and, and off it flew for nothing. And after him, Diomedes yelled his war cry, lunging out with his own bronze spear, and Pallas rammed it home, deep in Ares' bowels, where the, bolt, where the belt cinched him tight. Ares, the god of war, is stabbed in the stomach by the, by the spear of Diomedes. There, Diomedes, Diomedes, aimed and stabbed, he gouged him down his glistening flesh and wrenched the spear back out. And the brazen god of war let loose a shriek, roaring, thundering loud as nine, ten thousand combat soldiers shriek with Ares' fury when massive armies clash. A shudder swept all ranks, Trojans and Argives both, terror struck by the shriek the god let loose, Ares, whose lust for slaughter never dies. Well, we got him wounded, and of course now we're going to have some, some, some complaining that's going to happen. Very much like Aphrodite running to her mommy, Ares is going to then run. And he does. And, he, and he, he ends up on Mount Olympus with Zeus, and he says, at line, um, uh, um, right after uh, 1,000, line 1,005 or so. Father Zeus, he says, aren't you incensed to see such violent, brutal work? We, everlasting gods, oh, what chilling blows we suffer. The ironies are deep here. Ares is going to say, I can't believe all of the bad things that happen to us poor gods because of these humans. Thanks to our own conflicting wills, whenever we show these mortals some kindness, really, when has Ares ever shown anybody kindness? And we all must battle you. You brought that senseless daughter into the world, Athena, that murderous curse forever bent on crimes, while all the rest of us, every god on Olympus, bows down to you, each of us overpowered. But that girl, Athena, you never block her way with a word or action. Never you spur her on since you gave her birth from your own head. That child of devastation. The idea that Athena sprung full-blown from the head of Zeus. Just look at this reckless Diomedes now. Athena spurred him on to rave against the gods. First, he lunges at Aphrodite, stabs her hand at the wrist, then charges me. Even me like something superhuman. But I... I'm so fast on my feet, I save my life, else for a good long while, I'd have felt the pain writhing among the corpses there, or soldiered on, weak as a breathless god, uh, as a breathless ghost, beaten down by bronze. But Zeus, who marshals storm clouds, lowered a dark glance and let loose at Ares. Uh-oh, Zeus is now going to speak to Ares. No more, you lying, two-faced. No more sidling up to me whining here before me, you, I hate you most of all the Olympian gods, always dear to your heart, strife, yes, in your battles, the bloody grind of war. You get a sense that Zeus here seems to suggest he doesn't like all this killing of men by men. You have your mother's uncontrollable rage, incorrigible, that Hera, say what I will, I can hardly keep her down, Hera's urgings I trust have made you suffer this, but I cannot bear to see you agonize so long. You are my child, 
to me your mother bore you. If you had sprung from another god, believe me, and grown into such a blinding devastation long ago, you'd have dropped, de uh, dropped below the titans, deep in a dark pit. So great Zeus declared and ordered the healing god to treat the god of war. And at the end, then, we end up with Hera and Athena coming back to Mount Olympus, deciding that enough is enough. And that's how Book 5 will end. Let's work quickly now at Level 2A. Well, some uh, obvious messages here. Courage, obviously, is necessary to fight the gods. But then notice another interesting message is that the gods are kind of whiners at times, right? I mean, this, this shocks a lot of readers of the Iliad. They can't believe both Aphrodite and Ares are kind of whiners because Diomedes has wounded them. Uh, finally, let's just say this out loud. Obviously, these, especially these passages like the one I just read that kind of show the gods as whining, sniveling, suggest that this war is senseless. It's foolish. And yet, somehow, it seems to be important because of this whole thing of glory or clothes, right? At level 2b, notice the narrative technique, right? It, in some ways, the poet is trying to put you right there to watch, especially all those battles and exchanges, right? There is also that sense of it being really tense, right? Who's, who's going to kill whom and what's going to happen and that type of thing. If you're looking for a symbol in this one, well, you can think, of course, of Pandarus and his bow again. He says, man, I'll smash this thing if I ever get home. He doesn't because he dies a few minutes later. But notice the symbol probably here more than anything is Diomedes. His, notice, tremendous courage. He's afraid of, he's afraid of nothing. Notice as well his capacity to see. He can see the gods. Others can't, but he can see the gods. The irony, well, even gods, of course, who can't die, cry and whine. Especially, ironically, the god of war, Ares. Notice as well the irony that Zeus hates Ares because all Ares ever wants to do is to have people fight and strife. At level 3a, notice how this is, and we're comparing this now to other books of the Iliad, notice how this is a book that is quite different from books 1 through 4, right? Some will say, I've had students who say, I kind of like this book five better because it's less boring. There's more action in other words, all right? What are some other texts for you that show different types of scenes of, of battles from one to the next to the next? A a a Aeneas, of course, has to be saved in this book because Virgil's going to write his great poem about this Aeneas. How about this one? Zeus allows lots of pain to come to humans. Are you familiar with any text that'll where gods allow pain to come to humans. The one that, of course, probably comes most to mind from the, uh, from the Bible is the text of Job, right? Which, of course, resurrects that question of theodicy. We'll talk a lot about that when we pick up our Paradise Lost, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost later. Finally, at 3b, is it funny for you, or is it pathetic, this view of the gods and the ways in which the gods allow this kind of senseless suffering to happen and then when one of them gets hurt they whine about the fact that they got a little scratch or whatever does making gods more human anthropomorphic is our word right when we anthropomorphize these gods as making them more human does this make them more real to you or rather the opposite socrates we're going to see in plato's republic this is one of his problems with Homer, is that you can't really reference gods like this. You might fear them, but you certainly aren't going to reference them. What about the concept of fairness at 3b? Is it fair, for example, do you think that Aeneas can get saved by Apollo uh, and, you know, and is taken away? Apollo will, will pull one for him, but not others. And later, the death of Sarpedon will, will ask this very question, because Sarpedon's father is Zeus himself. And the argument will be made, no, 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 you cannot save him from his fate. Well, there you go. That's book five. And it's a fascinating book, uh, again, because of um, the way in which Diomedes stands um, as a, you know, an exemplar, right, in his, um, in his Aristia. And again, we're going to see a lot of this Aristia, these, these battle moments of the great heroes. Speaking of great heroes, in book six now, we're going to turn to the great Hector, who is going to return back to the city of Troy. This is a very important book for us because some important speeches will happen there. I hope you come back for our study of Iliad 6. Thank you.